In this lecture, we're moving through the digestive system, and we're going to start with the mouth, the pharynx, and the esophagus. So this is the first of the structures of the GI tract, where we'll talk about the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the esophagus. I want you to keep track of the structure and function of each of these areas as we move through. So look at the anatomy, and then look at the functions, the motility, digestion, absorption, and any other specialized functions for that area of the GI tract. So for this, we want to look at digestive processes by location. Digestive processes begin in the mouth and continue through the digestive tract until the final waste is eliminated. The digestive organs are continuous along the GI tract, separated by various divisions and sphincters into specialized functional regions, but ultimately a continuous tube hollow tube open to the environment even though it has these specialized regions. Let's start with the mouth within the oral cavity. The summary of functions here. The mouth helps with motility through chewing and the actions of the teeth, the tongue, and the cheeks through mastication. The secretions of the mouth come from the salivary glands including saliva and salivary amylase. But we also have mucosa within the oral cavity, which can release mucus. Within the saliva, we also have enzymes that can help to be antibacterial, and those are called lysozymes. Because we have a small amount of amylase, there's technically a little bit of carbohydrate breakdown. So I'm listing that under digestion, but it's a very tiny, almost insignificant amount here. There's no absorption relative to nutrient absorption in the mouth. Of course, we know clinically that being a mucosa, the mouth is able to absorb, meaning if we put medications or substances underneath the tongue or within the oral cavity, they can absorb into the bloodstream, but it's not the primary function of the mouth to do nutrient absorption. Here are the structures of the mouth, starting with the lips and the cheeks. The lips and cheek cheeks form the lateral walls and protect the opening of the oral cavity. They're lined by a mucous membrane of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium on the inside. The reason it's non-keratinized is that because it's covered in mucosa, covered in saliva, covered in fluid, uh, it doesn't need that keratinization or waterproofing. The upper portion of the mouth is formed by the hard palate that forms the anterior roof. That's formed by the maxilla and the palatine bones. Just behind the hard palate is the soft palate or the posterior roof of the oral cavity. The soft palate helps to close off the nasopharynx when swallowing, and the downward projection of the soft palate is the uvula. It's the uvula that hangs down in the back of the mouth when we open our throat and say, ah, the uvula is what moves. And when we swallow, the uvula tucks up to close off the nasal cavity as we're swallowing food. The tongue is that large skeletal muscle occupying the floor of the mouth. The tongue helps to move food around the oral cavity as it's mashing and breaking down food through the teeth. The tongue is helping to move that food through and also push the food back during swallowing. It's secured to the floor of the mouth through the lingual frenulum, and that also restricts the posterior movement of the tongue so it doesn't move too far back. The process of chewing through the oral cavity is called mastication. This is coordination of the lips, cheeks, jaw, and tongue muscles to grind and break down food. Saliva is very important here. 
Saliva helps to mix with the food so that it stimulates the taste buds and also so that it can move down the tract and not be stuck like a mass in the mouth. So saliva is produced by the salivary glands. It's mostly water, 99% water, but it also has electrolytes, mucus, salivary amylase, an enzyme for carbohydrate breakdown, and lysozymes, which are antibacterial. Remember, we're bringing in substances from the outside environment. So starting with the mouth, we need to have some of those immune defenses in case we're intaking things that have pathogens. Saliva also helps with motility, taste, and cleansing the mouth and speaking. Think about this in terms of what happens for a person who has dry mouth. Someone who has low saliva production or dry mouth is more at risk for tooth decay, has less taste, and also may have difficulty swallowing because the foodstuffs is not being lubricated as it's being moved down to the throat. Remember that the salivary glands are innervated by cranial nerves 7 and 9. The teeth. Of course, we could spend an entire unit on teeth and understanding the role of dental professionals and the role of oral health in overall patient health is very important. We're just scratching the surface here. Please appreciate the interprofessional need to involve dentists in the health of our patients. But the teeth. Teeth are responsible for mechanical breakdown, breaking food into smaller pieces. They are living structures. We need to take care of them the way we take care of all of our other organs. They're connected to the maxillary bone and the mandible with a blood supply. They have nerves from cranial nerve five and ligaments which do that connection, the periodontal ligament. They're protected by an outer layer of enamel. And there are two sets of teeth in a lifetime. Our deciduous teeth, or our baby teeth, and our succedaneous teeth, or our permanent teeth. No, I'm not going to ask you guys to count teeth on this exam. All right, now to the pharynx and the esophagus. The pharynx and the esophagus are a little bit less exciting with respect to function, but they are very important tubes for passageway from the oral cavity down to the lower GI tract. So they are very important for motility, that is swallowing or deglutition, moving the bolus of food from the mouth down through the pharynx, down through the esophagus, and ultimately to the stomach. The main secretions in the pharynx and esophagus are going to be mucus to help to lubricate that bolus of food as it's moving down. There is no digestion or absorption through the pharynx and esophagus. Remember that the pharynx, or the throat, is a shared passageway for air and food. As air moves through the nasal and oral cavities, it's also passing through the pharynx and then to the laryngopharynx down into the airways. As food moves from the mouth, it moves through the oropharynx, then just through the laryngopharynx before it moves into the esophagus. Remember that the esophagus is located behind the trachea. The pharynx is composed of skeletal muscles and is lined by a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. It's innervated by cranial nerves nine and 10. Remember that cranial nerve dysfunction of these cranial nerves can disrupt swallowing for patients and make it difficult for them to swallow. That, of course, can lead to the risk of aspiration or food moving instead of through the digestive tract, food being passed into the airway and all of the possible complications that can happen because of that. 
Esophagus then, continuous with the pharynx, is another muscular tube. We have what's called the pharyngoesophageal, or the upper sphincter. This helps to prevent aspiration and directs food away from the airways. It's contracted at rest. The upper one-third of the esophagus is skeletal muscle. The middle one-third is mixed, skeletal and smooth muscle. And the lower one-third of the esophagus is what I call the point of no return or smooth muscle. I call it the point of no return because have you ever had this experience where you swallow something pokey like a chip or something and, and you, you really wish that you hadn't? <laughs> so it goes through the pharynx and that upper portion of the esophagus, but once you get to a certain point, you cannot get it back up. So this is the point of no return. It's going to go all the way down no matter how much we wish it didn't. The esophagus is just in front of the vertebral column and just behind the trachea. And it travels through the diaphragm before entering the stomach. And that's an important piece of anatomy there because pressure on the diaphragm can actually lead to contents pushing up through the cardiac sphincter or the gastroesophageal sphincter. Contents from the stomach can actually push back up into the esophagus and lead to GERD. So the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach is the gastroesophageal sphincter. Because it's very close to the heart and leads to the sensation of heartburn when contents from the stomach move up into the esophagus, it's also called the cardiac sphincter. Of course, it doesn't actually burn the heart. <laughs> it's just where we feel that sensation is very close to the location of the heart. The esophageal plexus comes from cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, and there's also sympathetic trunk innervation. One of the most important pieces of the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus is this process of swallowing. So I want to show you the process of swallowing in phases. This involves coordinated activity of the tongue, the palate, the pharynx, and the esophagus. The first phase of swallowing we can lump into the voluntary or oropharyngeal phase. This is where the tongue from the oral cavity propels the food into the pharynx. That food bolus it then moves down the pharynx and the uvula and epiglottis are very important in this portion to make sure that the respiratory passages are closed off, preventing food from getting up into the nasopharynx or down into the airways. The bolus then moves from the pharynx to the esophagus. So as that food bolus moves down, the epiglottis is going to cover up the airway and move the food back into the esophagus and away from the larynx. Then we get to the involuntary phase or the pharyngoesophageal phase. This is where the bolus moves from the esophagus to the stomach through the cardiac sphincter through waves of peristalsis. So once we get past the pharynx, the food is now in the esophagus and the waves of peristalsis, movement of circular and longitudinal muscles, are going to move that food down from the esophagus and into the stomach. At this phase, it's away from the respiratory passages and the respiratory passages can then reopen. All right, that's it for the mouth pharynx and esophagus, let me know if you have any questions.